when you take that, um, uh, you take that uh, situation where you're facing this mountain, somebody's telling you you can't do it, plus all your experiences with being able to climb mountains and so on, and you put all that together, all that comes together in a moment, and your body says, boom, here's the significance of that, and you feel perhaps challenged. All right? Your body goes, challenged, I've been challenged. And what can come from that emotion then, the emotion then can then feed forward into behavior and ways of thinking. Oh yeah, I can climb that mountain. You can't tell me what to do. I'm going to climb. I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to climb it right now. Somebody else could be in that same external situation, you know, in front of that mountain. Somebody says you can't climb it. But also part of it, you know, their personal history and their experiences are that, um, uh, for instance, uh, 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 they have f failed at doing many things in the past, let's say. And so now, when you combine all of that together, their body sums all of that, sums all of those elements from the moment together and says, ah, here's the significance of that. And instead, this person said, maybe feels defeated. Feels defeated. So, you know, I think the way to think about emotions is it's your body it's like, you know, kind of like you do an equation where you've got all these variables that you put together and at the end equals. Well, one way to think about emotions is, is that at a moment in time, you've got all these variables, these things that are going on in your environment around you and all of the things that are going on inside of you in terms of your thought processes, your personal history, and so on. They all come together at a moment and your body is expressing them as an emotion. Now, things are changing from moment to moment. You know, situations are changing from moment to moment, and so we're, our emotions are often changing from moment to moment. I'll give you an example of that. Uh, for instance, when I do crossword puzzles, which I like to do, my, I don't, if anybody, any of you have ever really been into crossword puzzles, you know what it is to go through emotions as you do them. <laughs> you know, you, you, you're reading these clues and, and you, you know there's a, there's a question asked, and you know the answer, but you can't think of what it is, and you feel frustrated. And so you move on to the next clue, and you read that, and you know what it is, and you feel triumphant. And then you go to the next clue, and you think it's a terrible clue, and you, and you feel, what a stupid, you know, what idiot made this up? And you feel <laughs> angry or pissed off at the guy who made up the, the crossword puzzle. And then you go to another one, and you... You almost got it, but you can't quite get what it is, and you feel frustrated. And you, your, your emotions are always changing as the, the elements of the situation are changing, right? Those I call signal emotions. They are signals in the sense of they are moment by moment letting you know, if you pay attention to them, letting you know what is the significance of the situation this current situation to you. Current situ significance is I'm frustrated. Significance is I'm triumphant. Significance is I'm um, curious. You know, goes from moment to moment to moment. Most of the emotions we are aware of are signal emotions because they're changing. That's what we're aware of. We're aware of change. You're not aware, you know, you don't get aware of the shoe on your foot until I mention it. You're aware of it when you first put it on because that's new. Then your body goes, oh, okay. We're, we now know the shoe's there. You can forget about it. And you've, you're not aware of it anymore until I mention it or you, something moves your foot and there's been a change in your experience. And then you become aware of it. Well, so we're set up to, to have in consciousness that which is new, different, a change. So that's how come we're mostly aware of our signal emotions. In terms of modeling, signal emotions aren't very useful, I find. They're not very significant. Because as I said, they're just your body, in a sense, responding to, at that moment, what's, what's going on. When it comes to modeling, 
there is another level of emotion that I think is significant, and that we're calling the sustaining emotion, or if you like, the background emotion. Because it also seems to be, in experience, that we can have these, like, these background states or emotions that are operating in our experience that, are, that move through time with us, that don't last, they're not momentary, but move with us through, through time and through one context after another. For example, you all know what it is to you know, uh, start your day feeling you know, kind of hopeful and like feeling really energetic and hopeful, like this is a good day. And, and that stays with you through the day. You know what I'm talking about? And it starts affecting your thinking and how you interact and how you respond to what happens to you all day long. You could wake up the next day and be feeling, for whatever reason, sad, depressed, anxious, concerned, and that stays with you. And the same kinds of things that happen, you know, you're, you can have basically the same day, but have a very different experience of it. Your responses to it will be very different. So there are these moment-to-moment -moment emotional shifts, your body responding to what's currently going on. And then there are these kind of background emotions that tend to stay with you through time. Uh, and what, what we've found is, is that very often, if not always, when people are in a, operating within a particular context, uh, uh, an exemplar is operating within a particular context, that they often have this a background emotion or sustaining emotion that helps, in a sense, hold, hold their strategy and hold their beliefs. It helps keep them in a state that supports doing what they're doing. So let me give you um, an example from me. So in gathering information, well, let, let me, the crossword example, my sustaining emotion for that is feeling challenged. So when I'm doing a crossword, I'm feeling challenged the whole time. Even when I'm frustrated, I still feel challenged. Even when I'm confused or don't know what's going on in this puzzle, I still feel challenged. In fact, it's feeling challenged that keeps me going in it. If you pick up a puzzle, or if I pick up a puzzle, and I know the answer, know the answer, know the answer, and it's obvious it's simple, what happens to feeling challenged? <sighs> Drains away, and I can't keep doing the puzzle. It's pointless. It, it, it holds no attraction. The strategies stop. You know? But if I pick up a puzzle, which I have many a time, and gone through every every clue and not come up with a single word. All I've been able to do is go, well, this must end in an S and put an S in the square, you know, <laughs> and get it that far. That's fantastic. Because that is a tremendous challenge, and I will stay with that puzzle for days until I either figure it out or go over threshold. <laughs> ah! um, so background emotions work like that. They, they help keep you in a state that, that allows you to use those beliefs and use those strategies uh, to affect. When I'm gathering information, uh, that was uh, the people modeled how I gather information once. And what they found as the supporting, uh, sustaining belief, uh, emotion, which was very surprising, and often they are, uh, was love, that when I'm gathering, um, gathering information, what, I'm actually, what I actually feel is love. And it was surprising to me when it came out, but, but then when I you know, thought about it and felt it, it was not only is it right, is it true, it makes a lot of sense. Because when you think about what it is to f you know, feel love to somebody, there's this experience of being open and connected to this person and tremendously appreciative of you know, whoever and whatever they are. Mm -hmm. And those are all uh, qualities that are very useful and supportive in you know, gathering information from somebody, at, at least the way, the way I do it, the way I do it. So it made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So that's all the expl explanatory stuff. The, um, you kind of get the idea of the difference between these two? What we're really interested in in modeling is the sustaining emotion. If you're working with people in therapy, 
signal motions can become very useful and important. But in modeling uh, sustained motions. Now, the elicitation for sustaining motion is 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 pretty direct. You just ask. <laughs> <laughs> It's not always that easy to find because, as I said, it's often something that people are not aware of. It's subtle, it's in the background, it's not something you're aware of like feeling frustrated or excited or triumphant. Um, uh, you know, I certainly wasn't aware that I was feeling love when I was gathering information, but when I paid attention and discovered that was true, I read, you know, there was no question that that was true. So, of course, you've been sitting here listening to all this. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> probably uh, searching. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shereen, let me ask you. Uh -huh. So, when you are, so when you are there in your classroom, the child's been brought in it's from another culture, mm -hmm. and uh, you want very much for this child to be comfortable, that is, to feel safe in your presence, mm -hmm. safe in the presence of other children. And you engage in all of these various things to help that become a reality. Mm -hmm. So as you are mm, engaging with this child, mm. um, what are you feeling? What background feeling or what feeling is kind of always there in the background of your experience that helps support you in doing that? Well, I think I have two feelings. Um, one is uh, it's a challenge. Every time it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't know when uh, the child comes in. I've, I've had a little file about the child, but that's it. So, um, and I want that child to get to wherever. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the challenge. And the other side is... I don't know quite how to find. I actually, I want to give that child all those possibilities. So it's sort of some kind of affection I have for the child. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know whether I can really define it as love or something else. It's, it's, it's an affection that I have. And I sort of believe in that child. I know that child has some kind of potential. Um, and so I really want that child to, to be able to make it. Mm -hmm. Now, do you, I, I hope you, it's a good example of how uh, she's got, there's really two standing emotions that are operating simultaneously. And if you hear her talk about it, you hear them, she's expressing them both at the same time. They are both there. So, for instance, she's talking about, you know, I'm seeing all these wonderful things in them, and I want them to get somewhere. I know that they can. What, what emotion is that about? Challenge, right? So it makes a lot of, so, so first of all, just in terms of, you know, if we test this out in our own experience to see, does it work? It really does work in terms of structure. Challenge is about getting to something, getting to a goal, okay? So she's got an she's got an emotional state, a background state, that is kind of holding her in that way, you know, towards attaining some kind of goal. Suppose she didn't have that. Suppose she just had, uh, you know, affectionate, feeling affectionate towards this child. It would be different, wouldn't it? Wouldn't her whole, res whole response be different? You know, oh, I want this child to be comfortable and so on, you can still go, you can still have the same criteria uh, and so on, and still want to fulfill that. But without this challenge, feeling challenged that orients her towards the future and an outcome, you, you lose that sense of working at it and keep, keep moving, keep moving towards it, keep moving towards it. So she's not going to become complacent, she's not going to become accepting of well, he's comfortable, so everything's okay. You know, she's got a sense of there's a place to get to for this child, okay? So this makes a lot of sense to me. 
And at the same time, she's also got affection. Now, what's different about affectionate compared to the way we've been talking about challenge in terms of the structure? Challenge is about getting to an, an outcome, right? Mm -hmm. Affection is about appreciating right now. Right now. Exactly. Exactly. Affection is about, is, about, is about responding to somebody in the moment as they are right now, which, of course, is also throughout everything she she's described with us. And you can also see, suppose that you were interacting with these chi this child, even with the same criteria, and it's just about challenge. You just had that background state of challenge. Well, what happened, what can happen, what happens to me is it becomes much more easy, easier for me to mm, neglect or overlook what's actually going on with a child right now and my relationship with them in my efforts to get to the goal or the outcome. Do you guys follow me? Mm -hmm. So this create having both of these, both feeling challenged and affectionate at the same time, creates a great balance. In, that is very supportive of, you know, what it is she's trying to do with these children. Does that make sense? That uh, really works. Great. Okay. And you naturally agree with everything I just said, right? <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. That's what happens when it starts getting close to lunch. <laughs> I, I get brilliant. <laughs> I get brilliant. <laughs> okay. Um, let's do that. Let's go to lunch. And we'll come back in an hour and a half. Uh, I have a, just a few things to say about external behavior, the simplest piece, and um, then you guys will get to work with each other. All right?